Namaskar and welcome to Diplomatic Dispatch with me, your host, Vikas Varoop. President Ramnath Kovind was recently on a state visit to Jamaica and St. Vincent and the Grenadines. This was the first ever visit by an Indian head of state to these countries. Jamaica and St. Vincent and the Grenadines are active members of the Caribbean community. The visit of the President represented a continuation of India's high-level engagement with the countries in the Caribbean region and emphasized New Delhi's continued commitment to work with small island developing countries. So, this week's episode is devoted to India's ties with the Caribbean region and the many dimensions of this important partnership. The Caribbean region comprises a chain of 13 sovereign countries, mostly island nations, and 17 dependent territories surrounding the Caribbean Sea. To the north, the region is bordered by the Gulf of Mexico, and to the south lies the coastline of the continent of South America. The region has a population of approximately 44 million and has four predominant languages, namely English, French, Spanish, and Dutch, reflecting its colonial history. Gross national income per capita varies from around $800 to over $30,000 and most countries rely primarily on tourism while some on commodity exports as per the World Bank. India's links to the Caribbean date back to the early 19th century when Britain brought thousands of indigent labourers from the subcontinent to work in its plantations. Between 1838 and 1920, more than half a million Indians migrated to the Caribbean as Indian indentured labourers. During the 82-year tenure of the system, Indians had an indelible impact on the Caribbean landscape, not just by fulfilling their ascribed economic role as the proverbial saviours of the sugar industry, but also in terms of their social, cultural and emotional presence. Many of these Indians chose to make the Caribbean their new home. They became fully integrated into the local society and active contributors to their adopted communities. Let us not forget that Nobel laureate V.S. Naipaul was from Trinidad. Today, ethnic Indians comprise between 30 to 40 percent of the population in Guyana, Suriname and Trinidad and Tobago. The Indian diaspora in some other Caribbean countries is also significant, such as 80,000 in Jamaica, almost 20,000 in St. Lucia, 10,000 in Belize, 7,750 in St. Vincent and the Grenadines, and 5,200 in Grenada. These strong emotional and cultural links between India and the Caribbean countries provided a sound foundation for the modern partnership based on shared values of democracy and rule of law, active South-South cooperation and collaboration in the Commonwealth, G77 and the United Nations. India is also associated with the regional and sub-regional groupings of the Caribbean, such as the CARICOM or Caribbean Community and the Association of Caribbean States, where India is an observer state. In November 2003, an India CARICOM Joint Commission was established and in 2005, the first meeting of India CARICOM Foreign Ministers was held at Paramaribo, Suriname on the sidelines of the CARICOM Summit. The first India CARICOM Economic Forum was held in Port of Spain, Trinidad and Tobago in August 2005, followed by the first India-Caribbean Conclave in June 2009 and the first meeting of the India CARICOM Joint Commission in Georgetown, Guyana in June 2015. Several areas of cooperation were identified between CARICOM and India, which range from trade, tourism, the fight against AIDS, and meeting the UN Sustainable Development Goals to combating terrorism and UN reform. India's historic and warm relations with the countries of the Caribbean witnessed a new momentum following the meeting of Prime Minister Modi with 14 leaders of the CARICOM on the sidelines of the United Nations General Assembly on the 25th of September 2019 in New York. He announced a $14 million grant for community development projects in the CARICOM and another $150 million line of credit for solar, renewable energy and climate change related projects. He also announced the setting up of the Regional Centre for Excellence in Information Technology in Georgetown, Guyana and the Regional Vocational Training Centre in Belize by upgrading the existing India-funded centres in these countries. To learn more about India's multifaceted partnership with the Caribbean region, I will be calling upon two distinguished experts. 
His Excellency Jason Keats Hall is the first resident High Commissioner of Jamaica to India who took up his position in July 2021. Dr. Stuti Banerjee is a research fellow at the Indian Council for World Affairs. She received her doctorate from the Center for Canadian, American and Latin American Studies at Jawaharlal Nehru University and has been working with some of the leading Indian think tanks and research organizations for over a decade. Let me start with you, Dr. Banerjee. What is the significance of the first ever visit by an Indian head of state to Jamaica and St. Vincent and the Grenadines? I think like if you, I look at it holistically, I would say there are three main significant you know, opportunities that we see. First, as you said, it is a first visit by an Indian head of state to these countries and it shows the political engagement that we're trying to do and how much we're trying to uh, enhance and strengthen our relationship with them. Uh, it is also a milestone year for India because we're celebrating the 75th year of our independence and Jamaica, the first stop for the president in the Caribbean, is celebrating 60 years of independence. And given our colonial, joint colonial past, it is an important step. We, uh, we're celebrating our independence, we're celebrating the steps we've taken forward. It is also, if you look at it holistically, we are working with the CARICOM as a whole. We are working with bilateral relations in these countries. So working with uh, the Caribbean nations, we worked with Jamaica in the UN Security Council. There were non-permanent members in 2021. So we're looking forward to working with the other Caribbean countries within the UN Security Council as non-permanent members, within the UNGA, CARICOM, G77. And overall looking towards what we are talking about establishing or protecting the rules-based international order while trying to reform these organizations to you know, project the realities of the political life in the international arena that we have right now. The second, I think, is more economic. Economics has been the foundation of our relation. And to some extent, our relations with the Caribbean in this aspect has been um, slightly slow. So I think the thrust of the president's visit to the Caribbean was to showcase that economics needs to be strengthened. We're looking at new areas, especially in terms of climate change and how we can you know, develop economies which are sustainable because Car uh, Caribbean nations and India both, I would say we are also a maritime nation because of our islands and long coastline. Now, Excellency Hall, you are the first resident High Commissioner of Jamaica to India once Jamaica opened its embassy in New Delhi last year. How do you evaluate Jamaica's relationship with India and where would you like to take it during your tenure? Well, first of all, it's a tremendous honor to be here, and I'd, I'd also like to thank you for the invitation being on your show. Um, as far as Jamaica-Indian relations um, relate, Jamaica and India have had a long-standing relationship that date back um, over almost three centuries, when you think about the indentured laborers that came across. And you spoke of the milestones that we are celebrating. This is also a milestone year in Indo-Jamaican relations, 60 years of uninterrupted diplomatic relations. So it is, a, it is a tremendous milestone. Not many countries can boast this, this feat. And so we are particularly enthused by the track record that India has exhibited, particularly in the line of resilience and their initiatives towards mitigation of climate change, what they have done with alternative energy, how they leverage technology. All of these fields are areas which Jamaica is seeking to further develop, to add to our own development goals. And being here in India affords us this opportunity to bridge that gap. What would you say are the main pillars of India's engagement with the Caribbean region? I think, like I said, um, we have our diaspora. So that is one of the essential links that we have. We need to now build upon that. Uh, the diaspora that we have is in very prominent positions, uh, both in terms of public sector and private sector. So they open up doors for us, they open up opportunities for us. So we need to look at how we can um, enhance our relationship uh, through the diaspora, get these linkages up. Uh, second, I think relationship in between two, any two countries, economics plays a very important part. And like I said, we are now looking at uh, the future. And as the High Commissioner also said, uh, India has these initiatives like the supply chain resilience initiatives. We're looking at how to diversify our economies, look at new areas of growth. 
and the Caribbean countries, India, have been identified as the future economies that will drive the global economy. So why not get together and have your traditional areas of expertise, go build the foundations on them. But we are looking at the future and the future is going to be in terms of, you know, digital technology. How is digital technology going to affect each and every aspect of your economy? It's going to affect your social life as well. So how do you build upon these technologies to enhance your economy. Uh, blue economy is another aspect. Like I said, we are maritime nations. So blue economy is where we are heading because land-based economies mm. are coming to a saturation. And obviously, politically, we are working with them on various international platforms. I think we need to continue to deepen our engagement there and build on a holistic relation with the Caribbean islands bilaterally as well as a whole group that they represent. I think the ITEC program has also played a very important role in yes. capacity building in yeah, that region. Yeah, we are. So India's approach, if you see, Indian diplomacy has not just always been about what we need. It is also looking at countries and trying to get them to, uh, you know, what their requirements mm. are and if we can and how much we can fulfill them. So in that, uh, education has been a part and ITEC has been part of it. We give a lot of scholarships. Uh, I think one of the important steps that we now need to take is to publicize what we have in terms of scholarships, in terms of what we are offering in the ITEX programs, in terms of what we can offer uh, in other streams and publicize them so that people, the common person in the Caribbean nations and not just the politics or the civil servants know about it. You need to reach out mm. to the common people. Hi, Commissioner. The small island states of the Caribbean, given their size and location, face a very unique set of problems uh, compared to the rest of Latin America. Could you uh, talk to our viewers about the challenges that the small island developing states face? Very much so. SIDS face a unique set of social, economic and environmental vulnerabilities. Um, in the Caribbean particularly, um, we are vulnerable to climate change gradually by way of sea level rise, yes. which is affecting us now but more importantly, or more immediately, by the increase in tropical storms, hurricanes, which have been quite devastating in recent years. And these are all a product of, of, of climate change. Um, we're also faced with an inconsistency of supply um, and, and maritime connectivity, as well as air connectivity. Being independent islands, this is a challenge and something that has affected us. Another vulnerability is our dependence, our over-dependence on external sources. We import a great deal. So things like food security, energy security um, are, are, are major concerns for us now. Um, other areas that, um, that, that, that we face center around the, the, the lack of, of, of strong institutions with which to combat these challenges. And these are areas that we are working very closely with India, particularly with the International Solar, Solar Alliance, yes. which is headquartered here, as well as the Coalition for Disaster Resilience Infrastructure. These two multilateral organizations based in India, tremendous initiatives are very important to us in the Caribbean and are areas which we are looking to build capacity and, and, and prepare to fight and, uh, and meet resilience in the future. Dr. Banerjee, now turning our focus to trade. While India's overall trade with Latin American countries was of the order of about $33.85 billion at the end of 2920, trade with the Caribbean, as you yourself mentioned, is a small fraction of that. I think it's just over a billion dollars. So what are the difficulties in Indo-Caribbean trade and investment? And what can be done to boost it? Which are the sectors of promise that you see? I think the most prominent problem that we have is simply lack of knowledge. Uh, I don't think there is enough knowledge about what we can do in, in, with the Caribbean nations. Uh, there is very lack of knowledge on what their expertise is. And I think it's both ways. I don't think the Caribbean uh, nations and the industry is also looking at India and looking at what the expertise is. So I think the first step towards rectifying this is to identify sectors and to enhance our knowledge about each other. What do the Caribbean nations need that India can offer? And similarly, what does India need that the Caribbean nations have on offer? And again, I go back to the fact that we need to now look at the future because these are uh, two 
I mean, the Caribbean as a region and India are now looking at post-pandemic recovery. We've been hit by the pandemic. We've been hit by economic recession. So what, now we're looking to, you know, move beyond that. Overall, digital space would be very productive for your economies. Everything has now shifted onto the digital platform. Thanks to the pandemic, we've moved further into it and faster into it. So how we can look at digital platforms for your economies. And the other, taking again from what uh, the uh, High Commissioner was saying, in terms of tropical storms and you know, uh, other environmental effects, space technology is another aspect mm. which we need to look at. So how can we exploit space technology, not just for information technology, but for all of these aspects as well, so that they do not hit your economies that much. So it's a combination, like you cannot look at them in just a block, that this is what you're going to do in economy, this is what you're going to do in politics. They overflow. Mm. So it has to be a holistic relationship which flows from one to the other, and it has to be advantages to both of us. Excellency, now 12 Caribbean countries are members of the Commonwealth, where India plays an important and active role, supporting it particularly as a forum for small and vulnerable states. The Commonwealth Summit is coming up in Rwanda at the end of this month, and I understand that Jamaica has just put forth a candidate for the post of Commonwealth Secretary General. Could you tell us more about it? Yes, the Honorable Minister Kamina Johnson-Smith, our Minister of Foreign Affairs and Foreign Trade, has been put forward as a candidate for Secretary General of the Commonwealth. This is, of course, a tremendously important especially when you consider that the Commonwealth is the third largest multilateral organization. 54 members. 54 members with a significant population. And of course, what, what, what we were invited, we were requested to, 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 to put forward a candidate because it was felt that the Commonwealth needed a new direction. And if you look and see what the Commonwealth has been doing over the years, this is actually quite true. And so we are very enthused by the prospects of Minister Johnson becoming the next Secretary General because her experience, her skill set as a uh, participating in multilateral fora, um, as a consensus, consensus builder, um, bodes very well for taking this organization to the next level, for bringing about the needed consensus, for focusing on the right developmental needs of its member states and to really making it a, a, a newly relevant organization that works for all. When we were discussing earlier, you had talked about the tradition of sporting excellence in Jamaica. Now only one other country has won more uh, track and field medals at the Olympics than Jamaica. So tell us, is there any program for Jamaica to share this uh, ex uh, expertise with India? Um, and how has cricket become such a great binding factor between India and the Caribbean? You know, the story of cricket is such an interesting one because it is only in cricket where we refer to the Caribbean as West Indies. Yes. And of course, this unfortunately glorifies a grotesque navigational error of one Christopher Columbus who thought he had reached India. But of course, we like it because it, it brings us closer to India. Um, and it, it's interesting to see how both of us as former colonies have taken this sport and have beaten the colonizers at it. I think that's a, that's a matter of great pride. Um, unfortunately, West Indies has not been doing as well as India, but this is just the way, the nature of sport. Um, speaking of sport, you mentioned, you touched on the track and field, and yes, Jamaica has a tremendous legacy of excellence in track and field specifically. But this is not born overnight. This stems from decades of, of, of training, of, of fostering this. You know, people often ask me, why is it that Jamaicans run so fast? It's, it's actually quite a complex and interesting story that centers on, on what I would summarize as nine factors. There is, of course, the genetic factor. But if it were solely genetic, then other Caribbean islands would have this track record of success or West Africans from where most of our, 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 our athletes are descended would have that record of success. So it's, genetics is there, but it's not wholly genetics. One of the things that obtains in Jamaica is this culture of competition, of racing, of running from a very early age. And what this does is it creates a mindset, a competitive mindset that 
You know, when you look at the high school championships, they're more competitive than the Olympics. There are over 16 records broken every year at the, at the boys and girls schools championships. Another factor in it, what we discovered, was that the top, the most successful athletes in our program all come from a specific part of Jamaica. And what does that speak to? That speaks to a specific topography and terrain where these students walking to school, running to school, develop their muscles from early. So I hope India is taking notes because this is the, you, you need to start looking in the hilly areas for these athletes. Another factor in it, though, is the technique. Because at the end of the day, sprinting is a highly technical endeavor. And we have a tremendous legacy of excellent coaches. And another factor that has attributed to our success is the lack of what I would call brain drain or brawn drain. Because previously, our athletes would go to North America. Mm -hmm. And this would drain us of our, of, our, of, of, our, of our best athletes. And what we find is that the athletes are staying home in Jamaica. A very important factor uh, that, that, that really, I think, exemplifies the Jamaican ex um, history in it is our indomitable spirit. There is something about Jamaica, the struggles we have surmounted um, through abolition of slavery, independence from co colonialism, which have endowed us, imbued us with a sense of invincibility. We are small, but we say we are Talawa. We will take on the biggest of them. So are you sharing this with India? Is there some kind of a program so where your coaches are coming? We definitely have had, we have hosted a number of Indian athletes in Jamaica already. And I, I hope that this is why you have done so well in your recent <laughs> Olympics is that that fruit is beginning to bear. We do have a program where athletes can come to Jamaica from all over the world, but we are especially keen in establishing a memorandum of understanding with India that will facilitate this sort of exchange where we can have athletes come to Jamaica, coaches come to Jamaica and learn from the coaches and develop the programs and bring them back to India. Because I strongly believe that here in your 1.4 billion people, there is another Usain Bolt. Absolutely. Uh, Dr. Banerjee, now cricket is not the only glue between India and the Caribbean. What are some of the other facets of Indian soft power which find resonance in that part of the world? As His Excellency already spoke about the other aspect of sports, the sports diplomacy, yes. Uh, but if I could just look at it, you know, if I could just divide it roughly into two aspects and say, you know, there is this... Uh, government-based soft power that we are using or we push forward to, which is through our diplomacy and, uh, you know, these programs that mm. we have in which we speak to uh, our counterparts and identify areas where they want us to work with them. I think that builds an image of India, which is we are here to help you and not push our mm. own agenda. It's a mutual, it's a partnership between two equals. I think that helps our relationship very much because India all across is seen as a partner which is reliable, stable and equal. It's treating everybody equal. So that's the government based, mm. I would say, um, soft power that we are projecting. Individual or the non-government based soft power, I think, comes from the most important aspect uh, with the Caribbean is obviously uh, a link through music, I would say, music, dance and food, the cuisine, because a lot of our people have gone there and, and now settled there, have become part of the countries. They have contributed, you know, it's a, now a mix. So it's no longer Indian or Caribbean, it's a mix of both. So that is a soft power we have. Uh, apart from that, you obviously have your yoga, which is becoming immensely popular in the Caribbean. Uh, we also have both the Caribbean and India have traditional medicinal, uh, you know, mm. knowledge, uh, which I think should be shared. Uh, we can move forward on that as a new area of cooperation. But it is also a soft power that we have that this is a traditional alternative medicine system there. And I think there is no escaping from Indian films. Yes. Uh, the entire Indian film industry is India's biggest soft power uh, out there. So we are now... It, where Indian films go, Indian tourists follow. So I think Indian films are now exploring the Caribbean islands as their next destination. And I think we would be seeing a lot of tourists go from India. And that would be our soft power apart from, you know, our literature, which is immensely popular across the Caribbean. So those are our other soft power areas that we, I think we can 
Okay, too. So thank you very much, uh, both my panelists, for enlightening our viewers on India's multifaceted partnership with the Caribbean. Despite being located oceans apart, India and the Caribbean nations have much to contribute to each other. Cinema, cricket and culture bind us together, and technical cooperation, commerce, capacity building and technology are taking this partnership to the next level. That is all I have for you in this edition of Diplomatic Dispatch. Till we meet again next week, good night and goodbye.